Greetings YouTubers, and welcome to episode 5 in my Geochronology series. My name is PhD Tony, and today we're going to be talking about the great-grandfather of all modern geochronological techniques, radiocarbon dating. This is the oldest of the radiometric dating techniques, and when it was introduced in 1949, it completely revolutionized our understanding of geological processes and the timescales over which they occur. The prime mover behind its development was a man by the name of Willard Libby, who worked at the University of Chicago. Libby realized that radiocarbon, or carbon-14, would be produced by the spallation of oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere due to the impact of cosmic rays. It would then be metabolized by plants and animals within Earth's biosphere. Given an accurate value for the half-life of carbon-14, one could analyze an organic sample, measure the amount of carbon-14 within it, and determine the age of the sample, or the date at which the metabolism occurred. So this technique is more than 70 years old, and throughout that period many tens of thousands of thoroughly qualified academics have dedicated intense effort to improving the theoretical underpinnings and practical applications of this methodology as far as they can. I know I constantly harp on about this, and it must get repetitive, but it bears repeating. There exists a very extensive peer-reviewed literature dedicated to this methodology. Its limitations are particularly well understood, and when it is applied correctly to appropriate samples, its results are extremely robust. As most of you will have already guessed from the name alone, radiocarbon dating is a particular form of radiometric dating. More specifically, it is a form of cosmogenic isotope dating, because the vast majority of carbon-14 in the Earth system is produced by the impact of cosmic rays. And without so much as a buy your leave, as soon as carbon-14 atoms are created, they start undergoing radioactive decay via beta particle emission into nitrogen-14. The half-life of this process is approximately 5,730 years which is a lot shorter than the half-lives of the radioactive isotopes used to explore deep geological time, but is still plenty long enough to completely explode young Earth creationism. So let's assume we've got a sample from some organism, and we want to work out when that organism was alive. In order to do that, we need to determine how much carbon-14 is still present in the sample. There are two primary ways of doing this. Shown here is a schematic diagram of a liquid scintillation counter. This machine basically measures the number of photons emitted from a pool of benzene. Those photons are emitted as the sample emits beta particles into the benzene. While great care is taken to shield the apparatus from background radiation, nonetheless it is not possible to completely prevent this from happening, and this limits the accuracy of this particular counting technique. As a result, most modern researchers working in this field use accelerated mass spectrometry, or AMS. A schematic illustration of an AMS machine is given in this slide. The fundamental physical principle underlying this technique is that as a charged particle moves through a magnetic field, the magnetic field will exert a force on the particle that is proportional to the strength of the field and the charge the particle carries. If the charge the particle carries is known, and if the strength of the magnetic field is known, then the acceleration that the particle experiences depends only on the mass of the particle. Thus, particles with different masses but the same charge can be separated from one another because they travel along different trajectories. This is just a pretty simple overview. There are a lot of technicalities that I'm not going to explore. If you really want to dive into the details here, there are a lot of really good textbooks that have been written by some genuine experts. By that I mean people who have published extensively in peer-reviewed literature on the subject of geochronology and radiocarbon dating in particular. To be perhaps unnecessarily clear on this point, the term expert emphatically does not apply to unhinged and unscrupulous religious apologists who have sacrificed every last scrap of academic rigor, intellectual honesty and ethical principle in service of the evidence-free delusions of their belief system. Though no particular examples of this class of odious malefactor spring to mind just at the moment. So what shrill, uninformed bleatings erupt from young Earth creationists when they hear the term radiocarbon dating? Well, first of all, they'll go to their old standby. They'll say that we don't know what the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio was at the time that the organism was alive because we don't know what the cosmic ray production rate was. And it's true, this might be a problem in some alternate universe where we didn't have tree ring data and other forms of absolute dating. 
or where we didn't have uranium series dating or other forms of radiometric dating against which we could compare the radiocarbon results. It might also be a problem if we didn't have other cosmogenic isotopes that we could use to reconstruct cosmic ray fluxes, or if we weren't able to reconstruct the paleo-intensity of Earth's magnetic field from independent data. But in this universe, we can do all of these things, so it's not a problem. We do have tree ring data, and we do have uranium-thorium data from corals, so we can use these observations to identify and correct for fluctuations in carbon-14 productivity. Voila! Calibration of the radiocarbon time series is an important scientific endeavour, and it's been undertaken multiple times in the decades since its development. Yes, there exists a discrepancy between the absolute chronologies and the radiocarbon time series, but for ages less than 30,000 years, this discrepancy is actually extremely systematic so that once an appropriate calibration correction has been applied to radiocarbon dates, they provide very robust and accurate results. We can use ice core records to obtain time series of the production rates of beryllium-10 and chlorine-36, two other cosmogenic isotopes. The common features between these two productivity curves allow us to reconstruct cosmic ray fluxes, providing an alternative data set against which we can check our previous results. Another cross-check becomes available from paleo-intensity data. The strength of Earth's magnetic field influences the settlement of grains inside marine and lake sediments. The degree of ordering of these grains as they settle allows us to reconstruct the strength of the magnetic field at the time that deposition occurred. This gives us another data set against which we can compare the beryllium-10 and chlorine-36 results from earlier. These intercomparisons confirm the reliability of our reconstructions. Modern calibrations of the radiocarbon time series use all of these data sets, cross-checking results and validating analytical techniques through rigorous and repeated intercomparisons. Calibration of the radiocarbon time series is an ongoing academic exercise, with multiple academics dedicating careers to improving and refining the methodologies involved. The most recent calibration curve prior to this video was released in 2020. But of course, young Earth creationists aren't going to be convinced just because thousands of academics have dedicated years of their lives to improving and refining this methodology. No, they will move on to claiming that radiocarbon dating is fatally flawed because of the possibility of sample contamination. This objection is thoroughly mystifying. If a young Earth creationist drops something, do they just go, oh well, that's sad but I'll never be able to touch that again, or do they bend down and pick it up? If you've got a problem, solve it. Sample contamination is a big problem and can result in erroneous ages being assigned to samples. But instead of just deciding to give up on the entire technique, academics have weirdly decided instead to develop techniques for remedying the situation, such as mechanically or chemically cleaning the sample to remove contaminants, or developing techniques to recognise when a sample has been contaminated and which portions might be affected. Or we can chemically isolate specific compounds that are associated with the organisms we're trying to date. But even if it were the case that we could do none of these things, it would still remain the case that this line of argument is completely invalid, as I will discuss a little later in this video. Let's consider two well-known sources of possible contamination, volcanic emissions and local burning of vegetation. In both cases, these events will release an abundance of old carbon and will make samples in this environment seem older than they actually are. Fortunately, these events leave physical evidence of having occurred in the form of ash layers found in the sedimentary record, so we can easily determine which locations and which epochs have been impacted by these events, and we can increase the uncertainties associated with the obtained ages appropriately. Alternatively, it may occur that a given sample has an accumulation of young carbon on its exterior surface that has been deposited by a local geological process. These encrustations can be removed through a combination of chemical and mechanical cleaning processes. Sample contamination may also occur if young carbon penetrates into the interior of the sample through cracks in its exterior surface. This process is called permineralization and may be remedied again by thoroughly cleaning and preparing the sample. Rather than sitting around and whining about how hard geochronology is in the way young Earth creationists do, academics have actually been busy establishing a substantial literature on how to recognise and remediate diagenetic processes. 
diagenesis being the fancy geochronologist word for sample contamination and alteration by geological processes. A similarly extensive literature has been dedicated to the refinement and development of specific compound carbon dating. In this technique, a particular amino acid or fatty acid is isolated from the rest of the sample chemically. This allows us to determine the age of a particular class of organisms or a particular class of organic matter that is present in the sample, regardless of what other contaminants might be present. So researchers have dedicated an extraordinary amount of effort to identifying and rectifying contamination where it might occur. But even without these efforts, the young earth creationist objection is spurious. The existence of individual samples for which radiocarbon dating produces erroneous results cannot be used to logically infer that all such samples are so afflicted. It only takes one reliable geochronological sample with a date older than 10,000 years before present to completely destroy the young earth creationist position. Conversely, young earth creationists require that every such result is somehow invalid, a conclusion that they have spectacularly failed to substantiate. The third young earth creationist objection is that if you take a modern marine organism and date it, it will often produce a spectacularly old age under radiocarbon dating. While this may come as a surprise to the layperson, this is actually a well-known and well-understood phenomenon amongst those who know anything about radiocarbon dating. In order for carbon-14 atoms to get from the atmosphere, where they were created, into an organism that is being sampled, requires that the atoms be absorbed into the ocean, transported to significant depth, either by diffusion or some form of biological transport, and then transported via ocean circulation currents to the growth position of the organism. The time taken for this to occur varies from region to region, but may take as much as 2,000 years, which means that the carbon is already quite old by the time that the organism metabolizes it. There is therefore no inherent contradiction here. Yet again, the literature is replete with examples of researchers who have examined this process in minute detail. In fact, our understanding of this process is so complete that we can use fluctuations in marine reservoir corrections to reconstruct paleoceanographic and paleoclimatic conditions. But yet again, the young earth creationist position is simply not logically valid. We well understand how to obtain accurate ages for marine organisms, but even if we didn't, that would in no way reflect on the accuracy of results for terrestrial samples. At the time this video is published, the most fashionable young earth creationist argument against geochronology as a discipline is that some laboratories have reported ages of less than 50,000 years for diamonds and dinosaur bones using radiocarbon dating. There are two main problems with this line of argument. First and foremost, it relies on the assertion that radiocarbon dating is inherently more accurate and more robust than any other geochronological technique. This assertion is patently untrue. But let's assume that it is a valid assertion. In that case, the radiocarbon ages of older than 10,000 years would be valid and would completely destroy the young earth creationist position. It is an utterly self-defeating line of reasoning. But I guess the more interesting aspect is why did these results occur? And again, much to the disappointment of young earth creationists, it turns out that we know why this happens. Returning to the point just after a carbon-14 atom has been created in Earth's atmosphere, it will go on to form carbon dioxide and enter Earth's carbon cycle. In the terrestrial branch of that cycle, the carbon-14 atom will end up incorporated inside a plant. The plant may then be grazed by a herbivore, and the herbivore may be predated by a carnivore. Whatever organism the carbon-14 atom ends up in, it is most likely to be liberated from that organism either by shedding, secretion, excretion, or, on the death of the organism, decomposition. On liberation, the carbon-14 atom may enter the hydrological cycle and be transported through the soil column. It is at this point that processes such as encrustation and permineralization, which we discussed earlier, may occur. The most straightforward explanation for anomalously young radiocarbon results for dinosaur bones and diamonds is that the laboratories involved did not adequately clean their samples. But even if the samples had been thoroughly cleaned, it would not be entirely surprising if there was some carbon-14 still present. 
For instance, while any microbes present in the sample should have been removed during the cleaning process, they might nonetheless have deposited some carbon-14 in the crystal lattice of the sample. Alternatively, some of the phosphate ions within the sample may be replaced by hydrologically transported carbonate ions, and detectable levels of carbon-14 may be introduced into the sample via this process. As a final option, the carbon-14 in the sample may not have its origins in cosmic rays at all. It might have been created in situ as a result of other radioactive decay processes. The moral of the story is that if you use radiocarbon on samples where it shouldn't be applied, then processes whose effects can normally be neglected suddenly become important. Which is why reputable laboratories don't pull this sort of stunt. So that might be where I draw a line under today's video. This is a very superficial treatment of the topic of radiocarbon dating, but as I think I've established, the intricacies of the geochemical and biochemical processes involved in Earth's carbon cycle make radiocarbon dating quite useful, but also quite complicated. Given its inherent complexity, it is no surprise to learn that young Earth creationists have made radiocarbon dating their preferred target for misrepresentation and distortion. In order to undermine their audience's faith in geochronology as a discipline, they present radiocarbon results that any expert would recognize as being utterly invalid, but that their audience has no reason to suspect are completely nonsensical. So the key question to ask whenever anybody presents any sort of observational results that do not accord with accepted science, where was that published, and what was the peer review process? So that about wraps it up from me. Thank you so much for watching, I really do appreciate it, and please join me next time when I will be discussing luminescence dating techniques.